listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, this is Andy DeWire from Five Colorectal Cancer, welcoming you to today's webinar on Rectal Cancer 101. Um, we're very excited um, to go ahead and launch today's webinar. Um, before we get started, I'd like to say a special thanks to Michael Sola, Sharon Worrell, and our team at Fight CRC for all of their good work to help support these efforts. Um, so follow us online, follow us on Twitter, follow us on social media with Danielle, Andrew, and the rest of our team really doing a stellar job of making sure to recap and give timely information about the topic today. Next slide. So um, it's my pleasure today to introduce Mary Mullerkin, who is from um, the University of Madison, Wisconsin, uh, the Carbone Cancer Center. And Mary comes highly recommended from one of our um, stellar medical advisory board members, uh, Dr. Dusty Deming, who's been a leader in the field of rectal cancer and is a colorectal cancer survivor himself, has been a fantastic advocate and representative for the organization. So we're very, very excited um, for Dusty and Mary and all their support of our work and really excited to hear about all the approaches that Mary and team have um, incorporated and can learn from in terms of patient education um, for rectal cancer. Um, just as a, remember, a reminder today that all of our webinars are real-time as well as archived on our website. After the webinar, you can um, expect to receive the iHeart Booty bracelet. Um, for those of you who fill out the evaluation and survey materials, we really um, can't say enough about hearing from all of you about the information we're providing if the information is helpful and what else you need. And just to note that the I Heart Booty bracelets are in high, high demand. So if you get one, you'll be very, very lucky to have it. And we just need that evaluation survey in return. Um, just a quick note that today we want to make sure that this is interactive. Um, uh, Sharon World will be moderating the question and answer session after Mary's presentation. So during the uh, chat, if you don't mind going ahead and marking in or going ahead and locking in your questions that you might have, Sharon will go ahead and ask those real time during the presentation. Um, just a quick reminder that Fight Colorectal Cancer does have a variety of resources, of course, with our online blogging, tweet uh, tweeting, and information, but also um, we have our guide in the fight that is updated in the last couple of months that's available for download on our website, um, the webinar series, of course, and then, of course, our um, infamous Tabuti podcast where we cover topics that aren't necessarily always at the forefront and don't get discussed but definitely need to be there for really good coverage and to ensuring that we're all um, aware of some of the sensitive issues uh, that we need to bring to the forefront. So the Tabuti podcast, our guide in the fight, two things that we're exceptionally proud of. Next slide. Um, just a quick note that Fight Colorectal Cancer is um, here led by a team of medical advisory experts as well as leaders in the field, but we do not provide individual or um, specific medical direction or attention. That is really the role of physicians, primary care providers, and your healthcare team. And just a note that, of course, that if there's ever any sort of emergency, uh, dialing 911, um, all the information is used for educational and support services um, that are supposed to be in and should be in combination with your healthcare team. Next slide. Um, so as I noted before, we're really excited to have Mary on with us today. Um, Mary actually comes from us, as noted, from the University of Wisconsin Carbone Cancer Center. Um, she's been exceptionally involved in a lot of cancer survivorship efforts. We had a, a chance to visit a little bit about all of the work that she's doing with um, some of the highly, um, in, uh, some of the really great implementation areas of survivorship care plans, as well as looking at um, helping coordinate and guide a lot of the survivorship work within the multidisciplinary clinic. Um, and also the Gildas Club within um, her community. So we're really excited. Um, Mary has definitely been uh, recommended by Dr. Deming and team and has done a lot of work in helping support and guide patients for over the last 30 years. Um, so a lot of work, of course, with uh, formal education, and she is currently completing her master's degree in nursing education, which is super exciting. Um, so we want to just make sure that um, we uh, want to thank Mary and her team. And just a special note that for those of you who are joining who are our RATS, um, our research advocates training and support and those advocates, we will likely be um, doing some visitation with uh, the University of Wisconsin in the fall, um, and hopefully at that time we'll get a chance to meet Mary and her team. So Mary, thank you so much for uh, joining us today, and I'm going to turn it over to you. I'd like to say thank you to the Fight Colorectal Cancer Group for inviting me to speak today. Our discussion is going to focus on, oh, hold on a minute. There we go. Our discussion today is going to focus on who's at risk for breast cancer, how many people, how do we diagnose it, 
how do we treat various stages of rectal cancer, and treatment by stage, which of course is very different for each stage of cancer, survivorship, and future directions. Where are we going? I think it's helpful to begin every talk with what is rectal cancer and where in your body. We know about where our rectum is, but you know, it's, this is a little bit more detailed slide. So rectal cancer, malignant cancer cells form in the tissues of the rectum. The rectum's about six inches and it functions as a temporary storehouse for feces. The things on the slide I want you to take note of, this is the rectum here and the tumor. This right here is fat. Doctors will refer to it as perirectal fat or fat around the rectum. The green dots here are lymph nodes. And right here is the coccyx or the tailbone. You can see the line, the dotted line. And this is where when a patient has surgery, a cut needs to be right along here so that this, these lymph nodes are removed. So later when we talk about surgery, think about the slide. And when we're talking about radiation, think about it as well. Because you can see that in the surrounding neighborhood, there's lots of different structures such as the bladder, this happens to be a male, so this is the prostate, but in women, the vagina and the uterus are also here. So rectal cancer is, colorectal cancer is the third most common diagnosed cancer. This statistic here, is, which is 39,220 new cases per year, that's rectal only. If you group colorectal cancers, of course, it's much higher, but this is specific to rectal cancer, and it's slightly more prevalent in men than women. About 1 in 20 people of the general population will have rectal cancer. The median age is about 63 for men and 65 for women. So that leaves about 90% of cases are diagnosed over the age of 50. Good news is rates are decreasing over time, about 1% per year. And in total, we now say there are more than a million colorectal cancer survivors, which is great. And if we're attributing that to increased screening and better treatments for patients. And there's getting a lot of attention recently amongst the medical community and, of course, you know, people in the general population, about an increased prevalence in younger adults. And we see this and we're wondering, why is this? So we do know that the rate is increasing in people under age 40 to 50. And in studies, they show between 1984 and 2005, the rate increased by 3.8%, which represented a doubling in the rate. So now we know current data says about 18% of rectal cancer cases are in people under 50. And that would be 11% for colon cancers as well. And we know that of these, 20% are caused by familial syndromes or hereditary type cancers. That would leave obviously 80% that are not related. So it gives people in the medical community pause to wonder why is this? Well, they don't really know, but thinking maybe related to lifestyle behaviors and environmental factors. And by lifestyle behaviors, we mean diet uh, and a sedentary lifestyle. We're not moving around as much and we're eating a lot more processed food and potentially other environmental factors may come into play. So who's at risk for colon cancer, uh, rectal cancer, generally age 40 or older? Certain hereditary conditions such as familial adenomatous polyposis, which we call FAP, or Lynch syndrome. That really only represents about 5% of all rectal cancers, however. We know that having a parent, sibling, or a child, so we call it a first-degree relative, with a history of colorectal cancer may predis predispose you to an increased likelihood of, of getting rectal cancer. There are also behavioral risk factors, such as decreased activity and a sedentary lifestyle, which we think may, may decrease the risk up to 25% if you're active, uh, diet, weight, smoking, and alcohol. And again, a personal history, you yourself having colorectal cancer, polyps or cancer, ovary, endometrium, or breast. We know that those, that is Lynch syndrome where there's a constellation of those certain cancers that can occur together. So if you have one, you're at risk for, the, for another. The symptoms that a, a person may experience are changing your bowel habits, such as diarrhea or even constipation a narrow stool caliber, you, you hear people say pencil thin stools, or feeling like you just can't empty your bowels completely. 
blood in the stool, abdominal discomfort such as bloating, cramps, gas, or a feeling of fullness, change in appetite and an unintentional weight loss, fatigue, and anemia. So how do we diagnose and figure out someone has rectal cancer? Oftentimes, people will come in for their annual physical exam. The doctor will do a thorough history and a physical exam, and oftentimes a rectal exam is included in that. And when a physician can often feel, feel a tumor with their finger when they, when they go in and do the exam. Proctoscopy is also used, and that's a scope inserted that will go a little bit farther than the rectum and they can see in there visually and a colonoscopy, which is the gold standard for detecting cancer, biopsy, and there's a tumor marker called a CEA, or carcinoembryonic antigen. Now, um, some of the fecal tests are getting more attention these days, Cologuard and FIT testing, and those aren't wi widely used, but certainly in patients who are a little bit fearful of colonoscopies, they're beginning to get more of a role. So these are some factors that affect how, what someone's prognosis is and how well they'll do with treatment. Stage of cancer is incredibly important. How the type of stage a person has really determines how we'll treat them. Whether the tumor has spread into or through the bowel wall, where is the cancer located? Is it high, is it mid, or is it lower? Whether the bowel is blocked or obstructed or is, has a hole in it, which is referred to a perforation whether a tumor can be removed easily by surgery, and of course the general health of the person. What other illnesses does a person bring to the picture? And is this a new diagnosis or is this a recurrent cancer? To stage cancer, there are lots of tests that we do. Um, sometimes chest x-rays are done, but most often we do CT or CAT scans of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis. We like to use uh, CAT scans here because CAT scans detect lesions that are as small as a half a centimeter. Oftentimes, an MRI is needed to further characterize a certain body part, like the liver, so we'll often use MRI. Endoscopic ultrasound of the rectum is very important. A gastroenterologist will do this. They'll insert a scope into the rectum, and it's sound waves, and it really does a nice job of detecting the size of the tumor, the location, and are there surrounding lymph nodes involved? It isn't 100% accurate, but combined with a CAT scan, we get a pretty good idea of disease stage. PET scans are also used. The benefit of PET scans, the, we can see the whole body, um, and if, if there's a cancer, the lesion will light up to it's a bright yellow light. The, the limitation of a PET CT, though, is that detects tumors greater than one centimeter or bigger. So that's why we tend to use CAT scans more in our institution. Cancer spreads through three ways, through two, and that is direct spread. The cancer invades surrounding normal tissue, so it grows and it spreads into the perirectal fat that we were talking about, or lymph nodes, or other surrounding structures. If you think back to that, that slide, through the lymph system, so if a lymph node is affected, cancer can invade that lymph node and travel throughout the body in the lymph node channels. Through the blood, capillaries and veins are invaded by cancer, and those cells can travel throughout the bloodstream. And we refer to metastases as when cancer spreads from the primary site, in this case the rectum, and it will form a tumor in another site, such as the lung or the liver. So it isn't like you have lung cancer or liver cancer. It is a colorectal cancer that travels to that particular organ. I like this, this slide a lot because I think it's a really good visual of how do we stage cancer. This is fairly general, but I think it brings the, the point home. So with my mouse, this is the, the wall of the rectum. So the first layer is the mucosa, which is the which if you're from the inside of the lumen, it, it's working out this way. So the mucosa, the submucosa, this is the muscle wall of the rectum, a thin layer called the serosa. So that's right here. So the 
from here, this is the perirectal fat and the lymph nodes. So in a stage zero cancer over here, it's also referred to as carcinoma in situ. So there are abnormal cells found in the innermost layer or the mucosa of the rectum. So right here along the wall. And you can see in stage one now, it's invaded a little bit more. The cancer is formed in the mucosa of the rectal wall. It spreads submucosa and possibly to the muscular layer right here. Stage two, the cancer has spread through the muscle layer and possibly through the serosa and possibly near nearby organs. The most important thing are there are no lymph nodes involved. So it might, you know, up to here. Stage two, it could also be a little bit further, but these lymph nodes are free and clear. Stage three, cancer has spread to the mucosa, possibly through the submucosa and the muscle wall, and cancer has spread to the nearby lymph nodes. So you can see it's pushed through this wall and is now here. Or a tumor, cancer has, which is metastatic cancer. Cancer has spread through the muscle wall and it may have spread to some of the nearby adjacent structures here and it has to the lymph nodes and has spread to other organs such as again the lung and the liver. So standard treatment of rectal cancer can involve any one or all of these therapies. Surgery, radiation, chemotherapy, and targeted therapy. And I'll explain each of those in more detail with, with each slide. Surgery is the most common treatment for all stages of cancer. Radiation therapy or chemotherapy may be given before surgery. The term we use is called neoadjuvant treatment or neoadjuvant therapy. It just means before surgery, we're doing some other type of treatment. And really, the purpose of that, it makes it much easier to remove the tumor with clean margins, and it lessens problems with bowel control after surgery. Now, there's also, you, you can have, uh, after surgery, you can have chemotherapy or radiation, and that is called adjuvant therapy. So it's treatment after surgery or after radiation. And that, if you need that or not, is really dependent upon the stage. Types of surgery depends on the stage and the overall health of the person. So a polypectomy is early stage cancers or, you know, just there's an early stage polyp and, and we don't know what it is. So when you have a colonoscopy, the gastroenterologist will go in there and snip out with a snare any kind of polyps. It's sent off to the path lab and if they're benign, great. Uh, if there is cancer there, then it's removed and that's why the rates are doing better for colon cancer. Colon cancer and rectal cancer are very slow growing cancers. Usually if you look at that slide from stage zero to stage four, that's often over a 10 year period. Now, some cancers are more aggressive than others, so that's a general guideline. The next treatment is cryosurgery where an instrument is used to freeze and destroy abnormal tissues commonly used in stage zero or carcinoma in situ. There's also lo local excision. The cancer is not spread to the wall of the rectum and the surgeon will call it a TAMIS or transanal minimally invasive surgery. So essentially with this, several probes that are inserted into the rectum, the tumor is cut out which leaves a hole in the rectum and then the rectum is sewn together. So it's and it's sewed shut. Healing time is variable, but generally people within a month are, are doing quite well. Resection is a, where a large part of the rectum is removed. So the cancer has spread to the wall in this case. So a portion or all of the rectum is removed. And if lymph nodes, lymph nodes are removed as well, and we'll cover this a little bit more in subsequent slides. There's also radio, fre radio frequency ablation which uses high energy waves. They put a probe through the skin and it uses an electric current to kill the tumor. That's often used on lesions or tumors in the liver or the lung. Pelvic exenteration is a very extensive surgery. This is when cancer has spread to nearby organs. This is used very selectively. Parts of the lower colon, the bladder and lymph nodes are removed. 
In women, the cervix, vagina, and ovaries are removed, and in men, the prostate. There are three main types of surgical resections, and that is, again, for the stage cancer where it's invaded through the wall. The first one is a low anterior resection, <clears throat> excuse me, or an LAR. The tumor is generally in the upper part of the rectum, and patients often have a temporary ostomy. The, uh, the LAR in part of the rectum is removed and then reattached to the remaining part of the rectum, and it may be right away or later. So patients often have this temporary ostomy and people say, why do I need that? And the reason why is that you need healing time. When, the, when patients are hooked up immediately, there's a little more trouble with leaking. And after the surgery, about usually they say six to eight weeks go by and it allows nice healing time so that when things are reconnected, you'll have a better outcome. Proctotectomy with coloanal anastomosis. So the tumor is in the mid to lower third. The entire rectum is removed and the colon is attached to the anus. We don't do a lot of these um, anymore. You know, sometimes people who have had these, they have what's called a J pouch, where they take the colon and they create um, an artificial rectum. You can imagine the trouble is there's frequent diarrhea with this simply because the colon isn't the rectum, and so the storage facility is not what it should be. So frequent diarrhea and leaking is often a problem. We do do these, but with far less frequency. Abdominal perineal resection, or an APR, the tumor is very low in the rectum. There is too low to form a connection. So patients will then have a permanent ostomy. Radiation therapy, again, this is often done prior to treatment to make the surgical outcome better, but it's also used for if someone ha is not a surgical candidate, but they have problems with obstruction or just pain or difficulty, we often will do radiation that way as well. So how it works is energy x-rays or other types of radiation is used to kill the cancer cells. Most commonly, external beam is used where the radiation is delivered through the skin to the tumor. Less frequently, internal radiation is done, and that uses needles, seeds, wires, or catheters. The type of treatment chosen and the length of treatment depends on stage. So when patients have radiation therapy prior to a resection, it's 28 treatments over about five and a half weeks. So that's the typical standard way we do it. And that's usually in combination with chemo B, which is oral cape cytobine, that's the name of the drug, or 5-FU, that's given IV. But generally these days, we're able to do it with oral chemotherapy, which is more convenient. So chemotherapy is given at many different times during treatment, before or after surgery, and for stage 4 cancers. It's given in a variety of systemically, and that's IV or orally, or regionally. An example when it's given directly in, into an artery that leads to a part of the body such as the liver, so that's hepatic artery infusion, or chemoembolization. The advantage is you don't, when you give regional ch chemotherapy, you don't get a systemic effect on the body, and you can target that specific organ with chemotherapy. So in embolization, Substances such as a wire, coil, or a gel are injected into the hepatic artery to try to block or reduce blood flow to cancer cells in the liver. The liver is a little bit unique because it gets the blood supply from an artery and a vein. So if you block up an artery, you're still able to supply that liver through venous flow. So that's why this is an attractive option. So there's three types of embolization, arterial embolization, and a catheter is inserted in the femoral artery and it's snaked right on up, and just threaded on up to the hepatic artery and small particles are used to block the artery. So you block the, arter the blood supply, the cancer doesn't grow. The next uh, option is called TACE or chemoembolization. And again, the artery is cannulized with a catheter 
and chemotherapy is given directly to the lesions in the liver and then they embolize it or block it up so that chemo can stay there to kill that tumor. Radioembolization, small beads or microspheres are coated with a radioactive substance called Y90 or yttrium 90 and they're threaded in the hepatic artery and that radioactive substance over time kills the cancer cell. A lot of attention these days to targeted therapy. It's really the up and coming way to treat cancers. There are drugs that attack specific genes or proteins in a cancer. They often have different or less severe side effects than traditional chemotherapy, which makes, of course, that attractive for us um, to use to make life easier for patients. And they may be given alone or with chemotherapy. So an example would be Avastin or Bevacizumab. It's a drug that targets blood vessel formation. It decreases that tumor's ability to form blood vessels, thereby it, making it die and making it unable to spread to other parts of the body. There are also drugs that target something called epidermal growth factor receptor. A short uh, version of that is EGFR. This requires the tumor to be tested for something called a KRAS mutation. And this is, um, we do molecular profiling on a tumor. So we take your tumor and we send it off and we ask for specific tests to be done on it. And in this case, the tumor has to be a KRAS wild type. And what that means is this tumor does not have the KRAS mutation. And if this tumor does not have the mutation, the patient's eligible to receive a drug called cetuximab or panitubumab. And this has been very successful in controlling many stage four rectal cancers. There are other drugs called kinase inhibitors, and they work by blocking signals that tells the, the cancer cell to grow, thereby causing cell death. An example of this is a drug called regorafenib. I wanted to go back and say, um, with the KRAS mutation, about 10 patients carry this mutation. So those patients aren't candidates for this epidermal growth factor receptor drugs. That also means 6 in 10 are. So I'm a, I'm a glass half full instead of half empty. Treatment of rectal cancer by stage. Again, staging determines and the patient's health determines how we're going to treat this cancer. So for a stage 0 cancer, removal of the polyp that's all we do, that's all that's necessary. And then surveillance or watching for further polyps down the line. Stage one may, depending on how far it's invaded, may have a local excision. Again, that's where the tumor is removed from the rectal wall and closed back shut, or a bigger resection, or a resection requiring radiation and chemotherapy, usually before surgery, but in some rare cases after. Stage two, Resection plus chemotherapy and radiation, or just resection without needing any further treatment afterwards. Stage three is resection plus chemotherapy and radiation, usually given before surgery. Patient has surgery, and then depending on what the pathology of that tumor shows, they may or may not have chemotherapy. Generally, it, de it depends on it depends on how far the tumor has invaded into the wall. Stage four or recurrent rectal cancers, there may be a resection with or without chemotherapy and radiation. There could be a resection or pelvic exenteration. Oftentimes, again, we may do palliative radiation and chemotherapy or chemotherapy with or without targeted therapy. If there's an obstruction, a patient may have or a blockage, a rectal stent, or diverting ostomy. And we always send these patients for tumor molecular profiling. So with stage four recurrent rectal cancer, there is some nuancing and many, many factors need to be looked at as to how do we, how do we treat these, these patients. And part of it is, is how widespread is metastatic cancer? Is it one lesion in one organ? Or is it many lesions in one organ or lesions in several? So it really is very specific to each patient. Treatment of liver metastases in stage four cancer 
Oftentimes, they can be frozen with cryosurgery where the probe is inserted and freezes the lesion, thereby causing death. Or the radiofrequency ablation can be used. Chemoembolization, where they block the supply to the, from, to the hepatic artery, or using systemic chemotherapy is frequently used. Internal radiation beam therapy, or surgery to just wedge out, completely remove that section of the liver. That's often used. Treatment of lung metastases, cryosurgery, or RFA. And again, surgery to remove a section of the lung, a little wedge, perhaps an entire lobe of the lung, or removal of one entire lung, depending on, depending on how many lesions and where they are. The next uh, part of the talk is going to be living as a rectal cancer survivor. A survivor is defined by anyone who's been diagnosed with cancer from the time of diagnosis and for the balance of their life, so anywhere along that cancer continuum. The components of a survivorship care plan include a treatment summary. So this is the stage of the cancer, what treatments you received and by whom, and what drugs were used or what radiation or what surgery, all in, all in one convenient summary. There's also a suggested schedule for follow-up exams and tests. So when do you need a colonoscopy? When do you need a CAT scan? And really, who's responsible for doing it? Long-term effects of treatment, management, and when to call the doctor are included. And surveillance for recurrence or secondary cancers. How are we going to check and monitor people? And also healthy lifestyle suggestions that may reduce risk of recurrence. So typically, follow-up consists of doctor visits, and those are every three to six months. We usually start off with three-month intervals, and then gradually increase that to six months, and then gradually to one year. Colonoscopy is recommended. So if a person has had surgery, we recommend that the first colonoscopy is one year from the date of surgery. And then subsequent colonoscopies will be every three to five years depending on the results of the first colonoscopy. Where there's suspicious polyps, was everything okay? So when, it, when the, follow, the subsequent schedule is, will really depend on those, on that test. CT scans or other imaging is yearly for three to five years, depending on your risk of recurrence. So high risk or low risk will scan longer if high risk, shorter for low risk. And a CEA, which is the blood tumor marker, we usually do that every three to six months, and that usually correlates with when a person sees the doctor. Some side effects uh, linger after treatment, or they may take uh, months or years to develop. Commonly, fatigue is the number one cancer-related side effect. They did a study that approximated about 70, I think, believe it was 76% of all cancer patients experience fatigue. The best way for, to help us help you would be to keep a diary for one week and use a diary to, to plan your schedule. And so if we can look at this and say, looking at your diary, you do better in the morning or you need to get up a little bit slower in the morning and you have your strength in the afternoon. However it is to you, plan your activities around that. Make a daily schedule and plan in some rest breaks. Keep naps to less than 30 minutes and be active. They say that activity really is the number one combat, combatter to fatigue. And of course, the three Ps, prioritize, plan, and pace yourself. Neuropathy, that usually develops from one of the chemotherapies called oxalate that we give after people have had surgery, using that term in an adjuvant role. Uh, it's, it's very frustrating for patients. Neuropathy usually peaks towards the later part, the last few cycles of chemotherapy, and it can peak even up to eight weeks after therapy has stopped. Usually, after therapy has stopped and after it peaks, it gets better quickly over the next several months, but then can take up to three years or so to fully, to see the maximum amount of improvement. It, full recovery is, is possible, but sometimes it's not always possible. So it's really dependent on the person. The best things that we do is to take practical steps to manage your environment. And that is as easy as don't have throw rugs. 
uh, have hard soled shoes, keep your feet warm, keep your hands warm. Medicines haven't been all that effective in treating neuropathy, but I found in my practice um, things like acupuncture can be very helpful for patients. Changes in bowel function. This can happen from radiation. It can happen mostly uh, from surgery, but a combination of one, one, or, one or both of those. Imodium and stool bulking agents are very helpful, as well as a referral for pelvic floor exercises. And consult with a dietitian to modify your diet is very helpful as well. Now, in doing some research for this, I found out that phantom rectal pain or phantom rectal sensation is very common. I've not had anyone talk to me about this, but up to 50% of patients or more can experience this. And most of the time it resolves spontaneously. But if it doesn't, or until it does, there are several things that you can do that are helpful. Ice packs or warm bath, so try both. Antidepressant medicines, as prescribed by a physician. Again, pelvic floor exercises or yoga to strengthen the surrounding muscles. Relaxation techniques such as guided imagery. And there was also a suggestion to sit on the toilet and in your mind go through the steps that you would as if you were having a BM. And that seems to be able that seems to be able to reduce that rectal sensation that you have to evacuate. Many emotional challenges that survivors face, and it really it, it's a gamut of different emotions ranging. You may experience some of these, none of these, or all of them. Sense of relief, sadness, worry, fear of recurrence, losing the safety net. Once you're done with chemotherapy, now what? I'm getting chemotherapy, I'm not, and what am I going to, you know, it's just somehow comforting even though people don't like it. <clears throat> Role changes, and that may be through work or at home, changes in parenting, um, socially there are adjustments, and returning to what your normal function is. There's this phrase, the new normal. What is life like now since having cancer? Additional concerns, changes in sexual function. That can be from any of the treatments that are given. Infertility, returning to work, financial issues, and then additional concerns of do I need genetic counseling or don't I? All of these concerns should be addressed with your physician or your healthcare team. There are many, many resources. So be proactive. If something is ever on your mind, always address it with your healthcare team. Social workers are also helpful, but there's, there's a lot out there. And uh, be proactive for yourself. In terms of genetic counseling, that's a great question to ask your physician. And most of the time, it depends on age at diagnosis and family history. So those are the factors that go into do you need a referral or not. Lowering risk of recurrence. Maintaining a healthy weight, we're finding, is more and more key in preventing recurrence. <clears throat> being active, and by that, 150 minutes of aerobic activity weekly. Walking is a great place to start, and it's a wonderful exercise. Eating a healthy diet. We're starting to recommend that under 300 grams of carbohydrates per day, but a good rule of thumb is the two-third, one-third. Two-third of your plate should be fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and non-animal proteins, and a third of your plate can be animal proteins and aspirin a day as a potent anti-inflammatory <coughs> excuse me it's also very helpful and again whether it's a baby aspirin or full dose that really depends on your doctor's recommendation alcohol consumption reducing it it's recommended one drink a day for women and no more than two drinks a day for men and smoking cessation quitting smoking lots of resources to help in the community with that as well so what's new in rectal cancer? Um, this, these are two of the big studies right now that I think are, are worth um, most of our attention today. There's a clinical trial called the Prospect Clinical Trial. 
the trial's complete, but we're awaiting data analysis. So the difference is they looked at doing four months of IV chemotherapy prior to surgery, and that would replace chemotherapy and radiation. That's exciting. So if you don't need to have those, maybe this is better. Um, the, uh, the next trial is called TNT, or Total Neoadjuvant Therapy. And again, neoadjuvant refers to treatment before surgery. So in this case, IV chemotherapy for four months, followed by chemotherapy and radiation, then surgery. So once they have surgery, there is no further treatment required. The reason why they thought of this is because traditionally only 68% of patients complete all of their therapy after surgery. And a lot of that is people after that large surgery are just, they're kind of tired and a, and a little bit uh, exhausted from treatment. So this may be a better way to deliver therapy. So that concludes the presentation. Um, and feel free to ask me any questions you would like. Thank you so much, Hello. Mary. That, thank you. Um, that was really oh. wonderful. This is Sharon Worrell with Fight Colorectal Cancer. I'm just going to go ahead and change this over real fast. Thank you, Sharon. So if um, there are questions, you can go ahead and um, write them down. Uh, looks like we have a couple coming in. Um, Mary, we'll go ahead and start with, with uh, this question here. Um, yeah. In regards to the phantom pain that you had mentioned, um, how often do you see this among patients? You know, I, I have seen it. Um, put it this way, um, not often, but I haven't asked patients, and that was really one of the great things about doing this presentation is often people will have sensations and they don't always tell us what they're feeling. And so a lot of times it's up to us to ask and now I'll know to ask this. But um, I think people have told me they've had discomfort and I've used some of these ideas but not knowing that maybe that's what it was. So in the reading that I did, it's actually pretty common. You know, and I think it's more than half of patients. Interesting. Okay. Uh, thank you. We'll, we'll move on to the next question, and I start to see a lot more coming in here. Um, there's a question about um, a, being a colorectal cancer stage uh, three five mm -hmm. years ago and asking about what, what is the typical follow-up after, after five years. Right. And usually after five years, if everything has been, you've been disease-free, uh, we turn over the follow-up to the primary physician, and so at that point, it's mainly the the colonoscopies every five years. Set CT scans are no longer needed, and even CEAs, we you don't need to do them after five years. So really, it's just colonoscopies every five years, and congratulations on five-year survival. And that kind of leads into the next question as well um, about the provider who's responsible for the survivor's care plan. Who, who might right. that be? So in our, in our survivorship care plan that I do, we have, a, it's a table, and it will say on there, um, you know, physical exam and CEA, and then it'll have the colonoscopy, and then there's a, a box that I assign who will do that. And most often here at this cancer center, we see our patients initially every three months. So we're doing most of it for the first at least three years. So most of that is done here. But times patients will want, if they live a, a far distance, they may want their CEA done locally so that it's ready, so that the doctor can see it on their follow-up visit. So oftentimes we'll we'll send orders over to the, the local clinic to do that. Or if we want a CAT scan and the patient wants it done at, at home. 
but normally we're doing most of the follow-up for about the first three years. Thank Does that you. answer that? Yeah, oh yeah, definitely. Um, and how, uh, how might a patient talk to their doctor about getting help with the rectal pain that you discussed? Right, and so for phantom rectal pain, is that yes. mm -hmm. the question? So yeah. for phantom, okay. So if you're experiencing that, definitely tell your physician. And a referral to physical therapy for pelvic floor exercises would be a great way to start. That's also helpful uh, for people who are having trouble with bowel function. Really important. And the other thing is some of the antidepressants, there, there's a group called tricyclic antidepressants that help with kind of nerve pain. That would be a place to start if you're somebody that could tolerate those and that would be recommended by your doctor. So I think just good communication that, hey, I'm having this problem and I need some help. Um, typically, like opioid prescriptions, like you know, your morphine or those don't aren't typically helpful. And that's a way to sort of to to out what is your pain. You know, if if that is not working and you've been on those, then it's then phantom pain has to be considered that that's a problem. So ex the pelvic floor exercises and uh, a tricyclic antidepressant. Great, thank you. Um, let's see. What role does the KRAS testing play as a prognostic indicator, if at all, in rectal cancer? That's a great question. Um, KRAS, so much, but there is some thought. So we often do, it's called extended RAS or RAF testing. So KRAS is one part of RAS. There's also something called NRAS or BRAF. And the jury is still out on the actual, you know, can we say that people that are NRAS or BRAF positive, you know, can we without a doubt say these are more aggressive? Not yet, but we think that they are. So when we look at the data or the research that's currently out there, we believe that NRAS or BRAF mutations are associated with a more aggressive type of colon cancer or rectal cancer as well, but we can with KRAS. But the importance of it and is if you're a wild type where you don't have that mutation and you can get the EGFR drugs, if you're stage four, it, it definitely helps extend life. Those drugs are well tolerated and they do add time usually to overall survival. Great, thank you. I, we have a couple more minutes, some time for a few more questions. If you guys want to keep sending them in. Um, if someone is getting ready, Mary, to undergo treatment, what are their, what kind of specific questions should they think about before they make a decision of care based on functional outcomes? So it's a great question. And honestly, I think the best, it, and it depends on, you know, are you having surgery, or are you having chemo and radiation, but questions I would want to know is if you're having surgery, what's my bowel function going to be like after my surgery? What can I expect? The other thing is I would want to be clear in my mind, you know, as a patient of what are my long-term side effects with chemotherapy with radiation but I think knowing patients who I find I'll answer this by saying when I have a patient that's going to undergo chemotherapy and radiation followed by surgery and then chemotherapy which is mostly what I see I am we spend an, I spend an hour with that patient just myself that's excluding the time that the doctor has spent with doing patient teaching so I sit down and I let people know that this is what five and a half weeks of radiation will be like. This is what the recovery is like. Then you're going to have surgery, and then we'll talk about what surgery is like, and then recovery, and then chemotherapy. And I find that patients who understand what side effects are going to be, what life is going to be like, do much better. 
they're able, it's sort of forewarned, it's forearmed. If you know what to expect, you're so much better able to cope. And I think people who, who know that end up doing quite well with this therapy. But I think asking questions and sitting down and, and saying, what can I expect? And I think a lot of times we're not really good at talking about what sexual dysfunction will I have? If it's a young person, what does this mean for fertility? So really pitting your provider down and, and getting that information. Thank you, Mary. Um, in terms of exercise, um, outside of walking, safe, what are some safe exercises for those who've had surgery in these areas? Mm -hmm. um, I think gentle yoga is fantastic. So doing um, yoga, but also weights, weight training resistance. So that's good for bone health. Uh, so, you know, I think that's a part of, of how, that we often neglect is the importance of weight-bearing exercises. And if you don't have an ostomy, swimming is fantastic. Um, and I think you even can swim with an ostomy because now there's new belts that work that are great. They're called the stealth belt. Um, and I think anything that you can tolerate, biking is great. It's low impact on your joints. Um, I think those would be my suggestions. We're working on forming a walking group here at the Carbone Cancer Center. And eventually we'd like to get uh, everybody out there doing our our Cancer Center Fun Run Fun Walk. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Let's see if we have any other questions. Um, we've got about five more minutes here. Um, let's see. Here we go. Um, are fissures, tears, or other GI issues more common for rectal cancer survivors? I don't. I don't think so. Um, I think if you were prone to that beforehand, you're certainly going to be prone again. But one thing I will say, um, I'll backtrack on that and say, if you've had a radiation, you are more likely to have stricturing. And so if you're a survivor and you notice your caliber of your stool is smaller, um, then you need to go get checked. It doesn't auto automatically mean there's recurrence, but it may be that there's some scarring in that rectal area from radiation, so people are more prone to strictures for sure, which can cause fissures. So, yes. And the other thing, if you have had hemorrhoids, treatment may flare those up. And so there are people who have to have hemorrhoidectomies because of the treatment. So, yes, there may be more issues there. Okay, um, looks like that's, that's it for now. Um, thank you so much, Mary, for taking the time um, to share with us this afternoon. Um, and again, thank you to Fight CRC. Um, Michael and Andy for helping get everything together here. Um, I guess we'll go ahead and, and wrap it up. Um, I just want to thank you again for your time and let everybody know that the slides will be available online um, very shortly after this webinar. So feel free to have a look there and email if you have any questions. And of course, um, feel free to reach out to our resource line to speak to somebody if you have any questions that come up for you. And that's it. So thank you so much, Mary, um, for the time thank and you. for such a great presentation. Well, thanks for having me.